I'm going to be kind of real with you on a few things. So some of this might be a little difficult, but that's okay. We're real here at On Fire Ministries. Amen? Amen. Amen. (laughs) So the enemy's plan all along is to defile the habitation of God or destroy it, right? That's the whole agenda behind abortion is to destroy the habitation of God, right? To defile it, that happens in many, many ways. But I'm going to tell you the biggest way is through pride. I used a a highfalutin term, educable, while I was praying. Are you able to receive instruction? Are you actually able to receive it? There are many people that have come into the church and they will say, Pastor, I've been sitting in the pews for four months now and you have not noticed me. You have not noticed that God has put on my life a calling. And the real thing is, I'm just going to be real with you. It's not my job to notice that. It's your responsibility, not mine. Don't put that on me. Don't put it on any of our elders or any of the other leaders. It's not on us. It's on you. And... You know pride is evident when there's no sacrifice. And and sacrifice comes in many ways. It comes in ways of respect, like actually sacrificing your pride and going up to someone and saying, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Will you pray for me? This is what God's put on my heart. What do you think? I want you to pray for me about it. Many people have come through the doors here and within a couple months have left to go start their own ministries because they haven't been noticed here. I'm going to tell you right now, God is not going to bless that. He might bless it to some extent, but he's not going to bless it to the full extent. It's just I'm being real with you. And here's why. Because if, if we don't submit to each other as unto the Lord we don't get the fullness of his blessing. And the enemy tries to defile the habitation by putting these thoughts in our heads, like we're charging in the door and you will put me in this title, in this role, and you will... You know who we look for for leaders here? The people that don't ask. I've heard some things kind of going around. We put people in place who don't ask to be leaders. Because those are the people that are ready to be leaders. If you're not seeking the position in the ladder climbing, God has made you ready now in your heart to be put in there. It's the truth. That's where pride gets in is too many people have been climbing ladders. And in the church in America, he's put us in the greatest harvest the greatest harvest in the history of the world. We're going to see a greater outpouring of Holy Spirit than the time of the apostles. And he wants the vessels to be ready, to be aligned in him. Our spirit has to be aligned with our soul, has to be aligned with our body. We are spiritual beings. Our spirit man needs to be aligned. And in fact, I want to I just throw this out really quick. Our natural state is the spirit. That's reality. What's in the spirit is reality. That's God's reality. Truth is reality as God sees it. He sees in the spirit. So that's the reality. We have to bring our soul, our mind, our emotions, our will, our identity into line with our spirit man. And then it will manifest in the natural. So yes, God sees a truth in your life. He has put a calling on your life that is true in the spirit. Are you getting in the way of that in 
the soul and in the natural. Our perspective on life needs to be driven from the spirit down to earth. That's, we pray this on earth as it is in heaven. Do we mean it? Because the question should be, what does it look like in heaven? Or do we charge into a building and say, I will be the worship pastor. Haven't you noticed me? I've been in the front row for 10 weeks. I'm not speaking over anybody. Don't self-identify. Don't self-identify. <laughs> I, no, it's a good, it's a, seriously, it's a good testimony. Tika's got a great testimony about that. God, God changing attitudes and perspective. I guess you are our testimony today, Tika. <laughs> Hallelujah. God changed her, right? And, and as soon as that happens, instead of striving, if you feel like you're just, I got, I'm barely, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. They're gonna call me youth pastor by September or next, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna be there. You really wanna be youth pastor? Go talk to Chris. <laughs> Ask him about that, okay? It is a blessing. I don't want that to come across wrong. It is a blessing, okay? But there's a lot of sacrifice that goes into being a youth pastor. Your heart's got to be right. Your perspective's got to be right. He doesn't see the youth as they are now. He sees the youth as God sees them, right? And that opens the door for healing and, and just an explosion in their lives. This, this is the alignment we're talking about. Setting aside your agenda. What's his agenda? And that's what we're going to be talking about today because last week when we talked about the defiling of the habitation and child sacrifice, which is directly linked to hell, literally linked to hell in the name. Okay, literally. But okay, we got a habitation, now what? And this is where I want to go today. God gave me a scripture this week, just kept hammering me with it. He weeps for the destinies unfulfilled. And so now we're not talking about child sacrifice and those lives that have been destroyed. We're talking about those that should be as his body, fulfilling their destinies, but they're not because of the wrong perspective. We either pass through fire to death or we pass through fire to life in abundance. We separate ourselves from evil. We do all the right things. He's cleansed our habitation. We know that. He's redeemed the evil places in our lives. Now what? Well, there's something even more in God as there always is. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. If you could turn there in your Bibles today, reading out of the NASB. Whew. Pursue love. Agape. Pursue love. yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophecy or prophesy. Why? Why did he pick up prophecy? Why? We're going to talk about this today. Pursue love. Chase after love. Agape is that sacrificial, deep love. Deep love. And we're going to be real today. We're going to talk about some of the way love is defined in our culture today. We're talking about deep, sacrificial love. What is love? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's go in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. Verse 4. 
We read these at weddings, but do we really understand it? First of all, love is above all. We're going to talk about why that is. Love is above all. What is love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. This is the surface of love. This isn't the depth of love. This is the surface of love. This is the idea of love in our emotions. Love addresses each part of our humanity. It is expressed through each part of our humanity, not just one part. So this is love as emotions felt and conveyed, okay? But this is where our culture stops. Because we don't know what deep love is. We stop it. I don't feel loved. What is that? I don't feel it. This is just the surface. Now, there is a component of love that is feelings. You have feelings towards someone else. There is a component of love. There is. But daddy's heart is so much deeper. Man, it's so much deeper. If you're kind to somebody, yes, that's an expression of love. But you can't walk around bragging about because love isn't arrogant, right? And love doesn't brag. You can't write, well, I was kind to so and so and so and so and so and so today. I did my good deed for the day, loving people by being kind to them today. But that's where our culture is right now. And that's why our culture has no depth to it. Because love is so much bigger than that. There are so many marriages struggling right now because everybody's talking about feelings. They're stuck right there. He wasn't kind to me. She wasn't kind to me. So much deeper than that. You guys want to go deeper? Let's go deeper. The next verse. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked. It does not keep an account of a wrong suffered. This is love that is expressed through the mind. Our actions through the mind. They're performed the best if we have a new mind. If we have Christ's mind, we will not act disgracefully. We will not provoke anything. We will not keep an account of wrong because in our mind, we know God has given us his view of everything. His view of our spouse, his view of our children. How often do we say with our words something kind, but we're thinking in our mind something totally different? We say with our, our mouth, I love you to our child, but in our mind we're saying, you are such a loser. Let's be real right now. Let's be real. Or you're never going to make it. Or all the other curse. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. God, may you give us your mind so we can see as you see those people in our lives. And so when I say I love you, I actually mean it from the depth of my soul. I say I love you, and I see you as God sees you. I may not, I may not say it all the time, but you know what? I don't need to if it's coming from the depths of my soul. On the other side, are we receiving love that is from the depths of the soul? Or, we, or do we automatically say, that can't possibly be true, I reject that? Well, that's, that's on us then, right? Somebody can mean it and you're not receiving it? Remember, it's conveyed as well. He said, love our neighbor, right? So we have to also receive love from our neighbors. Amen? Our family. That's deep love. But that's still just the surface, guys and gals 
It's still just the surface. Let's go deeper. The verses continue. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps every confidence. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. This is where love gets deep. Ultimately, love is obeying his commandments. That's what the scripture says in those exact words. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. I can express it emotionally. I can express it with my mind and my actions. But ultimately, love is a choice. I choose you. God chose each one of us before we were even born. You know how I know that? Because it says our names are written in the book and then they're blotted out. That means he chose us. Love is a choice to rejoice in the right things. We don't rejoice in sin. We rejoice in truth. I have to choose to rejoice in truth because sometimes truth is hard. It is. I have to choose to rejoice in that. I have to choose to believe all things. Here's what that means. I choose to believe all things God has for your life, not how you are right now. Hear me right now. Whoever this is that needs to hear this again. I have to choose to believe all things about your life that God has for you, not how you are right now. You could be stuck in something. I'm not believing that for you. I'm believing all things that God has for your life. And we can proclaim it with our mouth. That's the action part, right? I can now proclaim it. I believe for you God's purpose is that you are in ministry. You are a pastor. You are an evangelist. You are a prophet. You're an apostle. You're a teacher. You're the most amazing drummer. You're the most amazing keyboard player. You're the most amazing community leader. You're the most amazing organizer. You're the most amazing business leader. I choose to believe that over your life. That's love. Not, you've got all this wrong, and here is a list that you need to correct. Hear me right now. We do this to our family. Here's all the stuff you got wrong. Here's the list you need to correct. And by the way, in case you didn't know, I'm going to keep repeating it to you so you remember. That ain't from God. Deep love believes all things. Deep love endures all things. This is the choice that when you have hard times with your spouse, especially in the car this morning coming to church, don't self-identify. When you have hard times with your spouse, dealing with old wounds and dealing with all the things that life has brought and you're like, I choose to endure. This throwaway culture in America, everything's disposable. I look back at what my grandfather said, what my grandmother said about stuff. Sometimes they didn't love each other, but they stayed, they chose to endure, right? We have this throwaway culture. Out of the microwave, into the garbage, out of the microwave, into the garbage. Out of the microwave, into the garbage. The choice to endure is where character is built. When we endure, that is deep love. And I want, I want you to picture this from God's perspective. How much has he endured with each one of us? Come on, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got a point there, Lord. <laughs> and he chose to endure because he doesn't see us as we are right now. He sees us as a finished product. 
So when you, when you have the perspective of God, you endure. You endure a dozen children. You endure the hardships in your marriage. I, whoever that is, I'm speaking to you right now. Just saying. Yeah, it's cheaper by the dozen. You endure. I don't feel this and this and this, so I'm not going to... That isn't what God says. Do vows mean anything anymore? I can't even get some people to commit to going through premarital counseling. How are you going to... If you can't even commit to that, how are you going to commit to your spouse? I mean, my goodness, what, do, do vows mean anything? When I, when I raised my hand, the many times I did, and took the oath of office in the military and in politics, and I said it, I, I guess I was naive or something because I actually meant it. And I will give my life to defend, because that's a great expression of love, lay down your life for your brothers. I will give my life to defend this country from all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I meant that. And I, I suspect that many of us veterans did mean that when we raised our hand. And we still mean it to this day. That oath has no expiration date. Vows don't expire because your feelings are hurt. Because I'll tell you something, some of the leadership in this country has hurt my feelings a few times, okay? <laughs> Some of the leadership in this county has disappointed me, right? And I've had to forgive them and bless them and speak life and believe all things over them as an expression of love. Amen. Right? So if we pledge our lives to our spouse, that's why the vow says in sickness and in health. How many marriages have dissolved because one of the spouses is too sick, it's too much to handle? In poverty and in wealth, he doesn't make enough, enough money, as much money as he should. Whew. We're being real today, man. I'm telling you, how many people have been in my office upstairs over money? And they've taken a vow. They've taken a vow and said, in poverty and wealth, guess what? That's real before the Lord. Because the Lord has been true to us in sickness and in health and in poverty and in wealth, and in trial, and in triumph. He has. And marriages are a picture of our relationship with Jesus. So true love is actually enduring. Making the choice to endure. But I have a right. Do you? Jesus had a right to abandon us. He did. He had a right, but he chose to endure and believe all things about each one of us. And then the verse ends, love never fails. 1 John 4, verse 4 and 1 John 4, 16 say, God is love. We, this has been so taken out of context. It's incredible. God is holy. He is. But why did John write this? Because the heretics, especially the Serinthus heresy, were saying that Jesus Christ was only a man and not God, that he had a Christ consciousness, that everybody had to achieve a Christ consciousness. And if you did enough, 
and you prayed enough, and you fasted enough, and you walked holy enough, and you dressed holy enough that you would get the Christ consciousness. And he said, no, he, he is love. Hear me right now. We've ministered now to the emotions and the mind and the will. The deepest love is identity. He is love. It's him. That's him. And if we are in him and he is in us, we become love. Woo, somebody. Everywhere we go, the Father's heart is oozing out of us. We are love. We are love. When we abide in him and him in us. That's when it, when it says pursue it on this earth, we continue to pursue that because that's what we want to be like. Amen? Now, I want to stop right now for a second. There are people in your life that have really wronged you. Some of you came out of gangs. Some of you came out of the drug culture. Some of you came out of horrendous marriages. And you walk around and you say, well, but pastor, I, I got baptized and we went through the whole thing and I forgave them and I blessed them and everything. There is something deeper right now. If you still react to that, there's a wound there. And God is with us in sickness and in health, which means he wants us healthy, right? He wants a healthy bride, right? We have a wound. He doesn't want the wound festering pussy with maggots. Okay, sorry for that visual. All right? But we have wounds over our soul that we have not healed yet. And true love of God, if we want to abide in him and him in us and God is love, then there is no hate, bitterness, vengeance, all that has to be healed. And many of us have held on to that for, for decades. Decades. I have literally sat in the same car with somebody who has betrayed me and blessed them. That was one of the, I mean, it's hard. That was one of the challenging moments in my life, just be able to bless them and mean it from the depth of my soul. Not just say words and be thinking something totally different. Actually mean it. Lord, I don't have the ability to do this. You're going to have to, you're going to have to show me. You're going to have to do this through me. Because I don't even know what it looks like to truly love. Because guess who betrayed Christ, each one of us? That picture of Mel Gibson I don't know if you watch The Passion of Christ, it's his hand holding the nail as he drove it into, because he said, I did, because we all have. And Jesus still blessed us. Now, we're going to continue. Love is also victory, that's his identity. When there is love, there is victory. When there is love, there is victory. When there is love, there is victory over every area of your life. And love and peace and joy come from the Spirit. You know how you know you're victorious? If there's joy. Hear me right now. You know you're victorious if there is joy. Because when, when you've won something, you are cheerful, right? You're celebrating all the time. And I'm preaching as much to myself right now as all of you. The, I can say theologically, Galatians 5, says the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy. Do I really have peace? And do I really have joy? So we know we have victory when we have joy over something in our lives. Romans 15, 13 says this, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you will abound in hope by the power of Holy Spirit. Hear this right now. Love, joy, and peace come from the Spirit. It doesn't come from something I do. 
It doesn't come from something I do. It comes in and I can't explain it. I can't rationalize it. I can't say I did this, this, and this, and now I have love, joy, and peace. Check. That's not how it works. When you have real peace, you have real peace, and you know that you know that you know you have real peace because it came from the Spirit. It didn't come from your mind. It bypassed all of that. 1 Corinthians 13, 2 says this, the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. I'm sorry, 14, 2. Does not speak to people, but to God. For no one understands, akuo, hears, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. That word akuo is where we get acoustics from. That's where we get the word acoustics. It means to hear, listen, and report. And this idea of mystery is the counsels of God to us by revelation. But here is why I'm connecting this with love right now. We can speak to God when we speak in tongues, spirit to spirit. When we speak in tongues as a body, spirit to spirit, there is power in that. Because his counsels are being released. His revelation is being released. Because in the spirit, that's how we connect with God. We don't even know what spirit is. And somebody actually asked that to me the other day. What is a spirit? What is spirit? You ready for this revelation? We talk about, and I, seen, I saw it all over the internet, actually. I researched it a little bit. People will say, we have a spirit we are not spirit. And I'm like, what are you talking about? No way. We are spirit beings. We are spirit. That's our natural state. We are spirit, which is the way we connect with God. Spirit to spirit. The problem is, and sorry, I don't want this to come across offensive. Our intellects have gotten in the way. I'm just going to say this for all of us, myself included, okay? We're not as smart as we think we are. <laughs> it's the truth. So if I know what I don't know, which is a lot, and I admit that, I become educable, and I say, okay, Lord, how do I deal with this? How do I connect with you spirit to spirit? And guess what? He's given us the ability to do that. And you connect spirit to spirit, it bypasses everything in between, and you get his unfiltered revelation. Pastor, I don't know how to pray. Pray in the spirit. Man, pray in the spirit. I don't know what to do in this situation. Pray in the spirit. But it sounds so weird, and it makes me so uncomfortable. Good. Good. Because that uncomfortableness is coming from your mind and your emotion. And that is the surface, and we want to go deeper. Amen? That's the point. The Spirit is us. That's who we are. Our soul, it is. It is the real us. Our soul is the expression of the Spirit. It's other things, too. But we express our spirit through our identity. We express it through our will. We express it through our emotions. We express it through our mind. But we are spirit. We are spiritual beings put here on this earth, in this body, this nice house that God has made, right? Amen. Come on, somebody. You have a nice house. But it's got so much repair that stop it. You've got a nice house. God sees you as a glorified body, by the way, the fullness of Christ. And so, so the next verse that we're going to read right now is going to bring this all home. Oh, I love it. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for edification, edification, excuse me and exhortation, and consolation. Now, if we are 
spirit and soul and body. So our spirit is us. Our soul is the expression of our spirit, but the unique us. And our body is a nice house. Follow this right now. Everything needs to be in alignment so God's reality is manifested on earth through each one of us. God created us to manifest his reality here on earth. Not somewhere else, right here, right now on earth. His reality is that we are all healed. That's his reality. That's how he sees us as a finished work. He wants reality manifested here on earth. His reality is he sees us completely free, no demonic oppression at all. His reality needs to be manifested here on earth. He sees us as his sons and daughters. He wants us to actually manifest that reality here on earth. He sees us as his governing body, his ecclesia here on earth. He wants that reality manifested through each one of us here on earth. Kingdom finances. He has the cattle on a thousand hills. He wants to see that reality manifested here on this earth. We don't believe it. I'm telling you right now, we don't believe it. As a church, we will believe it. We do believe it now. I'm barely scraping. My house is not my eye. That's not his reality. Do you want to mess, manifest his reality? Do you want to manifest his reality? You ready? Here's how to do this. You ready? Prophesy. Ready? Okay. All right. The word for edification, oikodome. This word means to build up an edifice as a suitable habitation of God. And oikos, that word is also tied to family. So it's not just your abode, it's also the abode for your family as well. So one of the ways that we prophesy, but I thought prophecy was just foretelling and just saying something that has to be true. In the, no. Who prophesies speaks to people for edification. Are you speaking to people and yourself in a way that is building up an edifice, a habitation to Jesus Christ and to Holy Spirit and to Father? Are you actually speaking that over your life? Prophesy over yourself. How do I do that? Do you believe all things God has for you? Then prophesy it. This, if, if you're not following yet, body, soul, and spirit, Holy Spirit, Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit to spirit, Jesus to body, Father to soul. Whew. And guess what? When we prophesy, it prophesies to each of these things. You ready for this? Who? Come on, somebody. This is the word of God. This is so awesome. And it's so simple. Edify. Prophesy edification. Build people up. Build yourself up. Because it's him doing it through you. Amen? The next word, and, and I love this too because it has some legal connotations to it. We, we say exhortation, but it actually can be translated encouragement. Paraclesis. Paraclete, the helper, is who? Holy Spirit, right? Here's what, it's, here's what it means. It is the urging of a close aid that delivers evidence that stands up in God's court. That's encouragement. Whew. And if, if we dig a little deeper in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. And the whole passage then is our identity in Christ. That we're heirs, that we're sons, that we're co-laborers. His spirit testifies. That's prophecy. Are we speaking that right now? So when, when you're actually prophesying, when you're speaking over somebody, you are a daughter of the living God. God is releasing you for ministry. I thank you for that. And it is going to flow in Jesus name. I am prophesying. And guess what this is? If you haven't picked this up either, this is an expression, actually one of the purest expressions of love. 
because I'm building up the habitation. I'm encouraging, testifying with Holy Spirit before the throne room, evidence that will stand up in court. You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. But I'm feeling so, will you stop with the feeling thing? You have an oppression of depression. Testify. (sighs) Okay, we're gonna have to say this again. All right. You have got to testify who you are. Testify it. He wants us to flow in him. Testify it. That's why we do testimonies. Because get this, his truth in us and through us is our testimony. That's it. It's our testimony. And a father's heart is, hey, son, tell me about the game today. What happened? Daddy, it was awesome. I scored two goals, and then some guy slide tackled me and kicked me in the shin. But I still got up, and I still fought on, Daddy. Man, that's a testimony right there. Thank you, Jesus. Or are you testifying of your depression? Testifying of your illness? That's become your testimony. No, it is not your testimony. You don't testify that you're sick. You don't testify you're depressed. You don't testify you're suicidal. You don't testify that you are worthless. You don't testify that you are in a broken relationship. You don't testify that you hate people or somebody hates you. You don't testify that you're poor. You don't testify that you're in the wrong position. You don't testify that pastor is ignoring me. You testify that you are a son, a daughter of the living God that he has raised up for this time for the greatest harvest in history. And that you are healed, you are free, You are loving, you are peaceful, you are full of peace, you are full of joy, you are full of courage, you are full of hope, you are full of faith, you are full of God. And that's the Father's heart. Okay. The last word, because there's more prophesying. We're going to prophesy today. Paramuthia. I love that word because it's kind of difficult to say. Paramuthia. It is the word that we translate consolation. But here's what it means. Calm, console, and comfort with a great degree of tenderness. If somebody is going through a tragedy in their life, You don't come up to them and go, well, it must be God's will. How how does everybody feel? We heard the, right? We're not talking about feelings anymore. No, I'm just joking. What it does automatically, people just shut down, right? What does a father do, though, if their son or daughter is going through a hard time? Must have been my will. Nobody does that. He walks up to them. He gives them a hug. Sorry, I'm over at the hug family now. (laughs) Gives him a hug. And he says, it's going to be okay. I love you. I'm here with you. That's all he needs to say. That's Father's heart, right? And it's also prophecy. This is the New Testament change from a old covenant to a new covenant. The truth is being released. His heart is being released in and through each one of us as his habitation. Don't be the weird house in your neighborhood that no one wants to go anywhere near. 
Okay, yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. Come on. Nobody wants, everybody kind of goes on the other side of the sidewalk. They walk way around that. Don't be that house. Be the house that is comforting, that is tender, that is gentle, that is calming, that doesn't stoke the fire. We all have friends like that where you come to a friend, you got a hard thing in your life, and you're like, so this happened to me? And instead of saying, hey, I'm, I'm with you, let's pray. They say, yeah, I can't believe they did that either. Let me add some stuff to that. Don't be that person. Comfort and prophesy because these are expressions of his love. So we're going to conclude with this. I ask the worship team to come back up here. We pursue love to become like him until such a time as we are so possessed by God that we are one with him. There's a mystery here, guys. In marriage, it says they become one flesh. This is a picture of us and God, right? We pursue love so deeply, not just being kind, not just having the right actions, but choosing it through the hard times and identifying with it, becoming it. We pursue it so deeply, so deeply that that's us. And when that becomes us, we become so possessed by him that we're one. That word possession has such a negative connotation, but it originally was from the Lord and Satan tried to counterfeit, steal it and make it a bad word. We want to be possessed by God. We want our habitation to be possessed by God. So when Satan comes up to knock on the door, he's like, well, wrong house. But all of our neighbors walk up to the door and they're like, hey, can I borrow some sugar today? Right? Sugar being the sweet honey of the word and prophecy. The deeper thing is marriage is a representation of this. Does your marriage represent this? Hospitality? Does it, does it represent the deep things of God, the deep love of God, the enduring love of God? Does it represent Him? Is it Him? Because we're one flesh, right? With our spouses, is it Him? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit minister to our soul, body, and spirit if we let him do it. But here is the bigger thing. When it says love your neighbor, we're also supposed to prophesy over our neighbors so that that same love is manifested just as God in his three persons ministers to us. If we do that, that's, that's true love. And I don't have to hear the culture say, love is a feeling. I don't have to hear the culture say, love is a car or a, a, a particular set of jeans. All right? Love is Him. I just want to get out of the way so He can manifest it through me. I want to edify. I want to encourage. I want to console. I want to do that for, for our, my spouse, my lovely wife, Victoria. But this takes time and intention. And here's the thing, in being real again, sometimes we just don't take the time. But when we start taking the time, all these other things we've been dealing with our life, all of a sudden start being solved. And we're like, what just happened? And it was God saying, thanks for letting me flow. Thanks for getting out of the way, bro. Oh, that's irreverent, Pastor. No, it's not. Christ called them brothers. Here is, here is the thing where I want to conclude. A lot of us have got our minds in the way of how we think things should be. Instead of saying, Lord, how are things 
in heaven and how should they be here on earth? If, if the church as a whole gets this, even a small portion of the church really gets this message, it transforms the entire nation, which transforms the world. If we get what real love is, if we get what real prophecy is, it changes the world because I'm no longer living for an agenda. He is living in me. He's actually living in me. Do you know what? This is a verb. He is living in me and through me. He is loving in me and through me. He's bringing joy in me and through me. He's bringing peace in me and through me. This is what it means. I pray today that God can speak to each one of our hearts where we've been holding on to something, been holding back, and we just let go of what the world is telling us, what our mind is telling us. And we embrace His reality. Because here's what I see in the Spirit. America is not finished yet, which means that His church is not finished yet which means our families are not finished yet, which means you and I are not finished yet. What I see right now with America is that the plans of the enemy right now are being completely shattered. What I see right now in America is a nation on the march to harvest the greatest harvest in the history of the world. What I see in America right now is not revival. It's an awakening so that He doesn't visit us anymore. He dwells with us for all time. What I see in America is all of the camp of the enemy is being plundered and is being taken and put in to the camp of the kingdom. What I see in America right now is an unlocking of our destiny that was written before the beginning of time, not only for each one of us, but corporately for all of us. That he said, Titus, I want you round about 2022, I want you in this Caleb, I want you round about 2022, right in this place. I want you, Dan, Pete, I want you right in this place. Bree, I want you right in this place. Kevy, I want you 2022 in a school that didn't exist two years ago, right in this place. Steve, I want you out of the hospital and I want you in this place in 2022. Let's stand on our feet right now and just embrace the destiny that He has for us. God, we thank You for putting us in this time and this place. God, we embrace the destiny that You have for each one of us, that You have for this country, that You have for this community. God, we speak that release right now out loud with our mouth. We believe it. We believe Your destiny for us, Lord, is a destiny of harvest. It is a destiny of awakening. It is a destiny of healing. It is a destiny of freedom. It is a destiny of totally unlocked heavens over us, Lord God. Woo, feel that one. Thank you, Jesus. We believe that your Holy Spirit is gonna flow like never before in the history of the church. We believe it. We believe this city will not only be the healthiest city again in the world, it'll be the freest city in the world. 
Come in right now. That you would heal our wounds and our emotions and our mind and our will and identity, our bodies. That you would heal the wounds in our community, Lord. Especially the wounded betrayal where people that were supposed to lead only led for their own gain. We forgive them and bless them right now in Jesus' name. Lord, heal that wound. Heal it. Lord, we thank you right now for your fire. May your fire come on each one of us and burn away the rest of it that's not of you. <laughs> Lord, may we burn with the fire of your joy, with the fire of your peace and the fire of your everlasting love that is so radical and unfathomable and so deep. May we burn with that right now. And not only burn with it for you, Lord God, but burn with it for our neighbors. Burn with it for our spouses. Burn with it for our families, Lord God. We thank you for making all things new right now. We embrace that and receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.